So today we're going to hear about a lady who is called Holy Anne. Her name was Anne, but they called her Holy Anne. I'll show you a picture here in a second. Dave, you can go sit down. Sorry, Xander, you can go sit down. Uh, there she is. This is a picture of Holy Anne. Her name was Anne Preston. Anne Preston. And that's a picture of her. I don't know how old she is when they took this picture. But uh, we're going to hear about mostly actually about when she started as a little girl. About some of you girl kids' age. So that's Anne Preston. Anne Preston. So that's today's story. Holy Anne. Now, she's also called the nickname for this chapter. This is chapter eight in the book, They Knew Their God. This is, she's called the Irish Saint. She was Irish. So when Anne had been in school for only one week, her teacher exclaimed, poor Anne, you will never learn anything. See, Anne found even ABCs so difficult that people thought it would be a waste of time trying to teach her anything. So she was asked to leave the school. Can you imagine that? They kicked her out of school because she couldn't even learn ABC. That's how difficult it was for her. So they kicked her out of school and she went back to her humble cottage with a little thatched roof in a town called Balamalaki. Bal no, Balamakali. Balamakali in uh, Armagh County in Ireland. I wish I had an Irish accent to pronounce those names. but. When she was older, Anne was known for her wide knowledge of the Bible and for how many of her simple prayers of faith were answered. This silenced everyone who had ever doubted or criticized her. So she was born in 1810 to a man named James Preston and his wife. And their home was not religious at all. So they, they didn't read the Bible. They didn't go to any church meetings or anything like that. All six of their children were forced to look for jobs as soon as they were able. So since Anne could not even learn the simplest things in school, she was sent to work as a babysitter or herding cattle. That's taking care of cows and sheep and all that. And all of those homes that she went to didn't care about the things of God at all. So she didn't grow up around the Bible or going to church meetings or anything like that. But finally... She came to a Christian home where the mother cared for the spiritual welfare of everyone who came into her home. And this mother, it wasn't her mother, it was the lady of the house, and Anne was there as a servant girl to work in that home. She invited this little servant girl named Anne to attend a Methodist Bible study. And there, when she went to this meeting, she saw that there, some people were weeping because of their sins, and others were praising God for saving grace. So to Anne's mind, since she had never been taught about anything spiritual, this was disgusting. Like, why would you cry about your sin and saving grace and all that? But the, the mother of the home invited her to go to another meeting the next Sunday, and she agreed to go. And the text of the sermon on this Sunday meeting was the command of Jesus, which goes like this. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Does anybody know where that is? Any guess? Sound familiar? The book? Any adults want to try? Who said it? Well, who said it first of all? There's a good question. Who said those words? I'll read it again. You, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Yes, Errol. Jesus said it. You're right. So if Jesus said it, what book is it probably in? Yes, Matthew's correct. Anybody want to guess the chapter now? Six. Matthew chapter six is correct. If anybody, you know where the Lord's prayer is? Oh, it's called the Lord's prayer. Our father who art in heaven. That's in Matthew chapter six. And right before Jesus taught his disciples how to pray uh, in verse 9 or so. He says in verse 6, so this is easy to remember, Matthew 6, verse 6. So maybe children, sometime tomorrow, because by the time you get home, it might be late today. Tomorrow, go get your Bible and read Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. Because this little girl named Anne, Anne Preston, 
she heard the preacher preach from Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. And she said, man, now remember, could she read? What do you, what do you remember? She didn't even know ABC. <laughs> but she heard this preacher preach from Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. Okay, so listen to the story. That evening, after she came back from the meeting, not even knowing fully why, Anne went to a small attic room upstairs in her house and knelt by the only chair in that room because she heard the preacher say that Jesus said, if you pray, go to a small room, close the door, and your father will be there in secret and he will hear you. So I love the little faith of this girl that she decided to just do that. <laughs> I've never heard of anybody that heard Jesus say this and said, I'm going to go do that, go into a small room. But she did. And so she knelt by the only chair in that room and she broke out into loud crying. Now her mistress, that is the lady of the house, she had a feeling what was going on because that lady knew God and she knew that something was going on in Anne's heart. So she heard this loud crying upstairs. And so she went upstairs and asked, what's the matter, Anne? And Anne replied, I don't know. But she goes, wait, wait, actually, I think I do. As I've been crying out, Anne told her, I see the sins that I have done from the time I was five years old. I don't know how old Anne was at this time, but she said, I've been praying and it's like in front of me, I see all the bad things I've done. I've disobeyed daddy, mommy that time. I fought with my brother or sister. I stole this. I told a lie there. All of a sudden, she's remembering all the sins she did since she was five years old. And it says, she says, I've been leaning, kneeling in front of this chair and it's like all the sins are written down in front of this chair, in front of me. Every single sin is listed there. And worse than that, it's like I can see that hell is open right in front of me to swallow me up because of all my sins. Her soul was very troubled because it had been awakened. It's like her eyes were open to see the condition of her soul inside before God. After that, she returned to her own room and continued to cry out to God for mercy until midnight. See what happens when you cry out to God, if, you're not, if your sins are not forgiven, God will show you the seriousness of sins not being forgiven. I must start there. We must see that hell is a real place and our sins, if they're not forgiven, will take us there. And she cried out to God for mercy until midnight. Now listen, God didn't answer right away. He wanted her to continue to cry out to him. And in desper desperation around midnight, she finally exclaimed, there must not be any mercy for me, Lord, is there? And right at that moment, the Holy Spirit came and spoke into her heart that her sins were washed away through the blood of Jesus. She didn't have any daddy or mommy there or preacher. She was all alone, maybe eight or nine years old. Some of you are that age. And she just said, Lord, I, I, I see my sins. I'm a sinner. I want to cry out to you. And God himself spoke to her. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing that God wants to speak to each of you. So after that, she picked up a New Testament. Now, children, could she read? No. But she picked up a New Testament, which was lying on the table, and she placed her finger on a verse. But because she still couldn't read, she didn't know what it said. So she prayed, Father. She knew how to speak. She didn't know how to read, but she knew how to speak. So she said, Father, if you were able to take away my heavy burden of sins, can't you help me read one of these little things? And a miracle happened. Anne was able to read at least part of the verse that she was pointing to. And that verse was, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. Anybody know where that verse is? Who said it, first of all? Yes, Jesus said it. So again, which book is it probably in? Maybe Matthew? In this case, it is John, you're right. So if Jesus said it, it's probably Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and maybe a few other verses, uh, uh, books. But in this case, it's John. Anybody know the chapter? Who, who did Jesus say it to? 4.14. John 4.14, 4, yes. John 4.13 and 14. Jesus said it to a woman at the well you're right some of you remember that story from sunday school so jesus met a woman at the well and he told her she came to draw water and jesus said if i give you water um, everyone who drinks of this water from this well will thirst again but whoever drinks of the water that i will give him shall never thirst john 4 
13 and 14 children. When you go home, you can try to look up that verse as well. Now, this little girl had been told by her school teacher that she would never be able to learn anything. And yet, here she was. She was able to read a little part of that verse somehow, a miracle. That means that you don't even have to learn ABC from school. If you are so unable to learn in school, God can help you learn. Like he did this little girl, little Anne. The teacher, the teacher had said, you'll never be able to learn anything. But because she asked in simple faith, God gave her the ability to read the Bible. But for reasons that only God knows, her mind was never able to read worldly things. Children, you paying attention? Her mind was not able to read worldly things. So one family for whom Anne worked didn't believe this. They didn't believe that you can only read the Bible, only certain words in the Bible. So they tried to test her out. So to test it out, they put a newspaper in front of her and asked her to read a certain paragraph. And she couldn't read any of it. But as she was looking at it, she saw the word Lord in there. And she said, I think this word is the word Lord, but it cannot be my Lord because my heart doesn't burn when I read that word. <laughs> the article was talking about Lord Roberts who is some person who was famous in the news at that time. And it was related to the South African war, but she saw that word Lord and she recognized that word. Isn't that amazing how she recognized the word Lord because Jesus Christ was her Lord, but she didn't know anything else. And she's like, but this isn't my Lord. It's talking about some other Lord. <laughs> so eventually Anne started working in the home of a man named Dr. Reed, whose wife was a Christian. And this family decided to move to Canada. And they invited Anne to go with them. And even though her own parents, remember the, this, this Dr. Reed and his wife were not her parents, right? She was just working as a servant in their home. But Anne's own parents, they were kind of sad that Anne was going so far away, but they agreed to let her go. And um, so she, she, Anne agreed to go and her parents were sad. And after a two-month journey, because back then you could only travel by ship, after a two-month journey, the Reeds settled in a place called Thornhill in Ontario, which is near Toronto, near Toronto. So this would have been 18, yeah, this was the early, still the early 1800s. Um, yeah, so they settled in near Toronto. And with all the changes she had gone through, the religious life of this Irish servant girl seemed almost to come to a standstill. So she stopped she didn't have that much of an interest in the Lord because, the, you know, they were traveling to Canada and she probably had a lot of work and kind of her spiritual journey went to the wayside. And um, um, uh, so even though she still called herself a Christian, her spiritual journey kind of came to a standstill. But her mistress, Mrs. Reed, uh, encouraged her to come to the church meetings with her. And there was a church meeting of the Methodist church there at Thornhill, which was organized by a, navy, a lady named Mrs. Phoebe Palmer. And that lady was very serious about the doctrine of holiness and about living holy lives. And Mrs. Reed kept urging Anne to join her at these meetings. And eventually Anne reluctantly agreed to go. She had been with the Reed family for about 10 years when Mrs. Reed passed away. And then Anne had to take care of the family of young children and she did that faithfully for each of them until they were old enough to leave home. So by now, Anne maybe was in her 20s or so, I don't know. But as she grew up, she had to kind of become the mother for these children until they were old enough to leave home. Now, neither Dr. Reed nor Anne herself had any kind of stability in their Christian walk. And to her sorrow and to Anne's sorrow, she would frequently get very angry and she'd have these bouts of anger and whenever the children that she had to take care of would get on her nerves, she'd get really angry and say something really nasty. And then she would be so sad about it because she didn't like being angry at the children. And she knew that that wasn't how a Christian should live. And she would also get annoyed when she saw how Dr. Reed, who was the man of the house, was inconsistent in his Christian life in seeking out to live out his faith. Sometimes they would have times of family prayer like this where it would just be their, the family um, she would place her fingers in her ears because she didn't want to listen to Dr. Reed's voice because she kind of saw that he was a hypocrite. He wasn't really following Jesus, but he liked to have prayer time. And so she would stick her fingers in her ears quietly 
because she didn't want to listen to him. It would annoy his voice annoyed him. And her life was one of constantly sinning and repenting, constantly sinning and repenting, falling into sin, getting angry, and repenting. And she thought that that's the best she could hope for until one day God's light showed her that a life of complete victory over sin was possible. A young Christian was visiting Dr. Reed and they asked him to lead the family prayer time. And he read from Psalm 34, verse 16. And this verse spoke very strongly to Anne. This is what Psalm 34, verse 16. Children, paying attention. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. I wouldn't have thought that if you asked me that a verse from Psalm 34 reached Anne, I wouldn't have picked this verse. You know, I have a lot of favorite verses from Psalm 34. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all his fears. Uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers from all of them. But this verse, Psalm 34 verse 16, this was the verse that spoke to Anne. Let me read it again. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. And Anne asked this young man to show in her Bible where that verse was. Come on in. Um, where that verse was found to put a, to fold the page in so that she could find it later. Because remember, she couldn't read. She couldn't find where Psalm was. So she told the man, "Can you? here's my Bible. Can you just put a little, fold the paper where that verse is? And then so that when I open it, I can find that also. That's how she was going to try to find this verse. So um, let me continue reading here. Um, she asked him to mark where the verse was in the Bible. By turning, by turning down the corner of that page. Then Anne went to her room and opened the Bible and prayed that God would show her what that verse meant. She heard that verse and she's like, I don't know what this means. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. And the devil whispered to her, but you can't read. How are you going to understand what this means? In simple faith, Anne replied to the devil, the Lord will give it to me. Again, a miracle took place and could read the verse. So continuing in prayer, she asked, what is evil? If Lord, if your face is against evildoers, what is evil? And immediately the sin of her own heart. So she, when, she heard, when she heard about evildoers, she didn't imagine that it was somebody else. I mean, I just read that verse. How many of you thought the face of the Lord is against evildoers and you think of some other <laughs> evildoers for Anne? She recognized that she was a sinner because of her constantly sinning. And she recognized that, that her, the evil in her own heart was revealed to her. And so immediately the sin of her own heart was revealed to her so amazingly that Anne spent the rest of the night crying out for deliverance from sin. She said, Lord, I'm an evildoer. I see the sin that I'm doing. And if this verse is true, your face is against me as an evildoer. And she, she didn't just ignore it. She didn't get discouraged. She cried out to God. She said, Lord, I know you don't want me to be against you. So set me free. She realized the power of prevailing prayer. Prevailing prayer means you keep praying, keep praying, keep praying until God gives you the answer. Just like Jacob. Anybody remember the story of Jacob where he prevailed against somebody? Sound familiar? Yes, Daphne? An angel, yeah. Some, somebody came, so yeah, is that what you're going to say? And he wrestled with him all night long. And finally, he couldn't prevail. Um, but he kept persisting until he got an answer. So just like that, Jacob, she kept praying and praying and praying and praying. I want you to remember that too, children. Now this, she may be a young lady at this time, but it started when she was a little girl that she just said, I'm going to cry out to God. Remember, she didn't have a daddy or mommy who knew how to teach her about Jesus. She didn't have a church that she could go to. She just had a chair. <laughs> that she could kneel in front of and cry out to God and God heard her. And she, in the agony of the soul, she was clinging to God and she exclaimed, I may die, but I'm going to keep crying until I receive it. And then she got up from her knees. She went downstairs and that young man who had led the prayer meeting earlier said, why, why is there tears on your eyes? Why are you crying? What's wrong? And she replied, I want to be completely free, body, soul, and spirit. And then he explained to her that the only way to receive holiness in the heart for which she was longing was by faith in the promises of God. He told her very simply, listen, if you want 
holiness on the inside. The only way you can have it is you must completely believe God's promise. And so she went back upstairs to pray. Uh, and it, well, before that, she, he quoted the verse. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. See, he was saying the only way to receive the promise, uh, receive holiness on the inside is you must trust that God promised it. And he said, he gave her a promise, this promise, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Okay, who said that? Anybody know? Yes, Errol. Jesus did say that. Anybody know where? Which book? Probably one of those four books again. Yes, Asa. Yes, Matthew's correct. Anybody know the chapter? You guys have actually memorized this pretty recently. Matthew chapter 7 is correct. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Easy to remember. We heard Matthew 6, verse 6. Matthew 7, verse 7. Two very easy verses to remember. Go and read them sometime. Uh, children this uh, this week matthew 6 verse 6 which is what go to your room and pray in secret god is there he'll see you even if nobody else is there god's there matthew 7 verse 7 ask him and he will give it to you what a wonderful promise and so here was Anne saying i want holiness i want i don't want to get angry all the time i don't want to fight whatever it is and the promise was simply ask god will give it to you so Anne went back upstairs and got her on her knees again, pleading, Lord, I've been knocking all night. Please open to me. Please open to me. And God responded to her. God answered her. She, he, because she kept praying until she got, God gave her the answer. And immediately she knew she had been set free from sin and her mourning was turned into joy. And for two hours, she started singing at the top of her voice. This is like one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And there she is in the room. She started singing at the top of her voice. She was so filled with praise. And indeed, the rest of her life was just like that. As Anne walked with God and was led deeper and deeper into the secrets that God reveals to those who fear him, her life was full of praise because she had been set free. And it was around this time that people noticed a difference in Anne's life. That this young lady who used to get angry all the time, all of a sudden she was being set free. And even if it took some time, she slowly, they noticed this. Anne is different. She's not getting angry all the time. There's a difference in her behavior. And so they started to call her Holy Anne. Because they noticed, <laughs> well, actually it started, first of all, because some of the boys in the neighborhood started to make fun of her. Because now she wanted to talk about Jesus. And they started to make fun of her. Oh, there goes Holy Anne. She only wants to talk about spiritual things. But then when she realized why they were calling her Holy Anne, Listen to this. This is really funny. She went and prayed, Father, they are calling me Holy Anne. Please don't make them liars that I'm not holy. <laughs> so you have to make me holy. <laughs> I don't want them to be liars. So I don't want them to be guilty of telling lies. So please make me holy. I love it. Her simple prayer was answered in the fragrance of her humble and faithful Christian witness, which spread into the lives of everyone whom she met. She became, indeed, became Holy Anne to those who knew her and to others for many years to come. There were many stories of answers to prayer that she received. You know, how she just simply prayed, Lord, I don't know how to read, but can you just help me to know this verse? And God answered. It was the simple faith of a little girl that God answered. So there were many other stories like that of simple answers to prayer. You know, I love that this is somebody that I hadn't heard of till I read this book. A lot of people who claim to speak, to do miracles in the name of Jesus, they love to be on TV. They love to have YouTube videos and all. This is a simple girl who prayed in faith for little things that she really needed, and God answered her. And, you know, it didn't matter that nobody else knew it. She wasn't doing it for other people to see. She just had a need, and she trusted God very simply like a little girl, and God answered her. So there are many other stories like that, which only the people around her knew. One example was that the Dr. Reed, who, how she was staying at, had a well in, outside his house, which always was dry in the summer months. And his young sons used to carry water from a long distance away for the needs of the family and their animals. One day, as Anne was talking to the children about how God answers prayer, so she probably had a time like this, and the children, she's telling them, God answers prayer. Uh, and she told them about some of her own experiences. One of the boys, his name was Henry, Henry Reed, argued, and 
if God answers prayer, why don't you ask your father to send water in that well so that us boys don't have to work so hard? Yeah, it's a good question, right? Now, she didn't argue with him. Immediately, she said, the question that, that Henry asked proved a direct challenge to her faith. Here she was trying to draw these young children to trust God. And so later that night, she went to her room and she prayed, Father, you heard what Henry said tonight. If I get up in the Bible study and say, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Anybody know where that verse is? My God shall supply all your needs. All your needs. If you have a need, God will supply it according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19, I think. If I get up and say that in the Bible study, the boys won't believe that I am what I claim to be. If I claim that Philippians 4, verse 19 is true, they say, well, you have a need. Don't we have a need? So she said, Lord, you must send water in that well. And she continued to pray for some time. And then God gave her an assurance that her prayer had been heard. So listen to this, children. She was praying, Lord, you've got to send water in that well. And God said, I've heard your prayer. He spoke to her heart. And she went to bed with the words, Father, if I am what I profess to be, there will be water in the well tomorrow morning. And she went to sleep and she slept soundly. The next morning, Henry was preparing for his long walk to draw water for the day when to his surprise, Anne picked up two empty pails and walked to the well. And in a few minutes, he watched with amazement. She returned to the house with the pails filled to the brim with clear water. There was water in the well. Amazing. Anne triumphantly asked, what do you say now, Henry Reed? And Henry could only ask in reply, well, why didn't you do that a long time ago and save us all that work? <laughs> now, years afterwards, a friend of Anne's who knew the truth of the incident said that from that time on, the well was never dry again, even in the hottest summer months. Anne lived to the age of 96. She lived to the age of 96 and her long life was filled with prayer and praise to God for what he had done for her and what he was able to do for others. She spent the last few years of her life in the homes of friends who considered it an honor to serve her as she got older. In fact, the mayor of Toronto came and helped at her funeral after she died. And the next Sunday he said, uh, at a, uh, he announced, I've had two great honors this week. It has been my privilege to have an interview with the president of the United States. This is a great honor, he said. This is the mayor of Toronto. The second is that I was a pallbearer. That means he lifted the coffin to Holy Anne Preston. And he goes on to say, with no discredit whatsoever to President Theodore Roosevelt, of the two honors, being at Anne's funeral was the better. That is the story of Anne Preston. Now, here's a little poem that's included in the book. It's not written by Anne or anything like that. But in fact, the, the author is not even known. But it's a little poem that, that's titled, That He May Be Glorified. I want you to listen carefully, children and adults. That He May Be Glorified. See how God used this little girl when she started like a young, young girl young, at a young age. And she trusted God. She came to a relationship with him. And along the way, she kind of, you know, you remember how her spiritual life kind of slowed down a little bit or stalled. Kind of she wasn't following Jesus so, as wholeheartedly. But she kept seeking God. And her life was useful in a simple way. She didn't do anything big and great. But the simple story of her faith and how she was able to be a blessing to others is a challenge for us. So here's this poem. She was only a simple serving maid in a home of idolatry. What could she do to serve the Lord in her lonely captivity? Anybody know who I'm talking about? Who this poem's talking about? I'll, I'll read the next line and then you'll know. If my master would go to the prophet, she said, in all humility. Anybody know now? Yes, sir. Yes, Naaman's servant. This is a little poem. But the first verse is about Naaman's servant. If my master would go to the prophet, she said, in all humility, he would learn of Jehovah of Israel and be healed of his leprosy. She was only a simple serving maid whose faith had been sorely tried. But God has chosen the things that are not, that means nothing, that he might be glorified. 
So it's using the example of this little girl. She could have thought, well, I'm a little girl in this, in this house. How can I help? But she just made a little statement to her mistress, and that's how Naaman got healed. Okay, here's another story, the second verse of this poem. He was only a lad from Jerusalem, not specially bad or good, but straight to the master he went and said, here's my little pa parcel of food. Anybody know who that was? Yes, sir. The boy with the five loaves and two fish. Yes. It isn't much, but it's all I have. My mother gave it to me. The loaves are a few and the fishes are but two. I gladly give them to thee. It was only a parcel of food for one, but that day it was multiplied. God has chosen the things that are not. Nothing that he may be glorified. Okay, verse three, the last verse. She was, an only, she was only a humble village maid to whom Gabriel came that night. Anybody want to guess who we're talking about? Yes, Steph. It's Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was just a little village maid and Gabriel came that night and he said, thou art highly favored of God, he said, but she trembled at the sight. Fear not, he added, I bring thee good news. A son shall be born of thee. The kingdom of David shall be his right, and Jesus his name shall be. She was only a humble village maid in whom God had come to abide, to come to live. But God has chosen the things that are not, that he may be glorified. So don't, so what's the moral of this story? Don't think about being somebody big and great, somebody famous, some preacher, or somebody whom everybody talks about. God has chosen the things that are not. That means the people who cannot do anything, people who feel like they're not good enough or I'm not as good as that other person, whether it's soccer or baseball or studies or ABC even. You think, I mean, this little girl, she couldn't even do ABC. All of you kids can do ABC better than Ann Preston could. And yet see how God used her. So if you feel like, oh, I'm not good enough or I can't do this or I can't do that, the world may say, well, you're good for nothing, but God's looking for you just like you are, to use you. All right, so that's the story of Anne Preston.